AC electrical circuits, we're going to be taking a look at lab number 11, Parallel Resonance. Under Objective, it says this exercise investigates the voltage relationships in a parallel resonance circuit. Of primary importance are the establishment of the resonant frequency and the quality factor, Q, of the circuit with relation to the values of R, L, and C components. Under reference sections, I'm referring to Shams Outlines, Basic Electricity, 2nd edition. We're going to be taking a look at Chapter 21, Series and Parallel Resonance, and we're interested in the parallel resonance. So Chapter 21 is all about series and parallel resonance. And you can see we have a chapter on parallel resonance, and they talk about pure parallel LC circuits. Unfortunately, they don't have a section on LCR circuits. They do talk about practical parallel LC circuits in figure 21-6. In figure 21-7, they give us impedance and current response curves of practical parallel LC circuits at resonance. And they do talk about Q of the parallel circuit. They also have a nice section on bandwidth and power of resonance circuits. And figure 21-9 talks about bandwidth of a tuned LC circuit. And figure 21-10 shows us the resonant response curves for higher and lower Q values. Unfortunately, inductors are not 100% inductors. They do have a resistive element to them. So we have to be able to convert from a series to a parallel type circuit. And for this, we need to reference our textbook. And we can see that we can convert R in series with XL to R in parallel with XL. So now XL becomes purely inductive and it's in parallel with a resistor. And these are the formulas that we're going to be needing today. In the theory overview, we can see that a parallel resonance circuit consists of a resistor, a capacitor, and inductor in parallel, typically driven by a current source. At some frequency, the capacitive and inductive reactances will be of the same magnitude, and as they are 180 degrees in opposition, they will effectively nullify each other. This leaves the circuit purely resistive, the source seeing only the resistive element. And you can see they've given us a couple of formulas. So under equipment, you can see we're going to be using the Keysight EDUX 1002G oscilloscope with built-in function generator. Our DMM will be the Mastec MSM9803. As usual, I haven't bothered with the serial numbers. We're not going to repeat the experiment, so I'm not interested in uh, recording them. Under components, you can see I've given you a list of components we're going to be using in this lab. And to the right, I've given you the color codes for the resistors, so it'll make it easier for you to find them in your parts kit. As usual, we measure our components to find out if they are within tolerance before we start the lab. So you can see my 10 nanofarad capacitor is actually 13.45 nanofarads. So already that's off by about, what, 30%. The DC coil resistance of my 10 millihenry inductor is 22.3 ohms. Remember, a 10 millihenry inductor will probably be labeled 103. My 2.2K ohm resistor measured in at 2.177K ohms. My 10K ohm resistor was 9.88K ohms. And my 100K ohm resistor was 100.2K ohms. So this is one of our circuit test OP60 uh, times 10 oscilloscope probes. Uh, as you can see, the wire is a little bit uh, thinner 
than our times one probes that we've been using. The times one probe typically is under ten dollars whereas a times ten probe like this would be somewhere in the fifty dollar range. At one end here we have the BNC connector that we're all familiar with. At the other end we have our positive connection and our ground or zero volt uh, reference connection and the zero volts is connected through this fairly thin wire to a little alligator clip so it can clip onto ground planes and that kind of thing. On the positive tip of the probe you can see that we can actually retract it and it has like a little hook in there so the hook can actually go around pieces of wire or around resistors so typically it would just clip on there like so and just hang off and it wouldn't fall off and to disconnect it you just retract it again and then take off whatever it's hooked to taking a close-up look you can see that we have a slider switch on here so if we move it all the way to the top it's on times one and if we put it in the center it's on reference or it's shorted out to ground and if we have it in the lower position it says times 10. So on the times 1 position the input resistance of the oscilloscope is about 1 meg ohm and when you slide it down to the times 10 it makes the input uh, impedance of the oscilloscope 10 times higher so it becomes a 10 meg ohm input impedance that way your oscilloscope uh, doesn't load down your circuit. In the center here there is a place for a small screwdriver so typically what you would do is you'd hook this up to a square wave generator and adjust it until your square wave looked exactly square. So you're actually adjusting the impedance of the probe uh, we're not going to bother with that today. We just need it on times 10 so it's a higher impedance for channel 2. So this is our schematic today, figure 11-1. And you can see we're going to have a voltage source rather than a current source. It's going to have an internal resistance of 50 ohms. So when you're working with resonance circuits, you have to account for all the resistance in the circuit. So the first resistance is the 50 ohms that's internal to the function generator. The next component we have is RS. And basically what it is is a 100k ohm resistor. So if we have a 100k ohm resistor, basically our whole voltage based power supply is going to become a current source because whatever we connect to the 100k ohm resistor is going to be insignificant compared to the 100k ohm resistor. So the 50 ohms internal to our voltage source is insignificant compared to the 100k ohm resistor so we can ignore the 50 ohm internal resistance. And then you can see we have a 2.2k ohm resistor so basically that's going to be insignificant compared to the 100k ohm resistor. So you'll notice in step 2 of under procedure it says the large value of RS associated with the voltage source will make it appear as a current source equal to approximately 10 volts peak to peak divided by the 100k and that's equal to 100 microamps peak to peak assuming the parallel branch impedance is much less than RS. So looking at this part of the circuit, it's now become a current source and it's generating 100 microamps of current going into our parallel circuit. So we have RA which is 2.2K. We have our inductor and its internal resistance. So we have a 10 millihenry inductor and our coil resistance in the past it's been around 22 ohms and that's in parallel with C which is a 10 nanofarad capacitor and then we're going to take our V parallel or our output voltage 
across the entire parallel circuit. So under schematic, you can see I have inductor in series and its internal resistance in series. So that's the 10 millihenry and the 22 ohm coil. And then we have the inductor in parallel and its internal resistance in parallel at resonance. Now it's very important that we use it at resonance. So we have R coil parallel in parallel with XL and that's XL at resonance. So to transform R coil from series to parallel, we use R coil parallel is equal to the R of the coil squared plus XL, that's at resonance squared, divided by the resistance of the coil. And XL in parallel is equal to the resistance of the coil squared plus XL squared, now that's XL at resonance, divided by XL, which is also at resonance. So under procedure, step one, this is a low Q circuit. We're going to use the figure 11-1 with RS as 100 K ohms, RA is 2.2 K ohms, L is 10 millihenries, and it has a coil resistance of 22 ohms, and C equals 10 nanofarad. Now we're to determine the theoretical resonance frequency and Q. You must convert the inductor's coil resistance to the parallel equivalent resistance since this will affect the Q. We're to record the results in table 11-1. And based on these values, determine the upper and lower frequencies defining the bandwidth F1 and F2. We're to record those in table 11.2. And it says, since RS is so large, we can ignore the effects of RG in the calculations. And RG is the internal resistance of the function generator. So I've given you the uh, calculations that we need to perform. Uh, these are calculations for both circuits. This is with RS equal 100K, C equal 10 nanofarads, L equals 10 millihenries, R coil. We'll assume everybody's is going to be the 22 ohms. And the applied voltage is going to be 10 volts peak to peak. So our frequency at resonance is 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. Now this is the simplified formula. It'll work fine for our case. So F at resonance is going to be 1 over, and I've put brackets in to indicate that we need to hold things together for order of operations. So we've got 2 times pi times the square root of 10 millihenry times 10 nanofarad. And it's important to keep those together when you're doing the square root function. And you can see the resonant frequency is going to be somewhere around 15.9 kilohertz. Now XC is 1 over 2 pi FC. So that's 1 over 2 pi times and the frequency is the resonant frequency that we're interested in. So that's 15.915K times the 10 nanofarads. So that works out to 1K ohms at an angle of minus 90 degrees. XL is equal to 2 pi FL, which is equal to 2 pi times the resonant frequency of 15.9 kilohertz times the 10 millihenries. And that works out to 1K ohm at an angle of plus 90 degrees. So you can see XC and XL are equal in magnitude and opposite in phase angle. We now have to convert the coil and XL to their parallel equivalents. So our coil becomes 22 ohms squared plus the 1K ohm squared which is XL, so we're still working at resonance frequency. So we divide the whole thing by 22. Notice the 22 at the bottom is not squared. 
So our coil ends up being equal to 45.5 K ohms. And you can see that's almost insignificant compared to RA of 2.2K. But when we get to RA of 10K, it starts to be a factor. Converting XL for the parallel component, it's equal to the 22 ohms coil resistance squared plus the 1K, that was the resonance of XL, divided by 1K, and that equals pretty darn close to the 1K ohms that it was before. Now completing the calculations for the low Q circuit of RA equals 2.2K ohms, we can see the total resistance of the circuit is equal to RA in parallel with R coil parallel component. So that becomes 2.2K times 45.5K divided by the 2.2K plus the 45.5K, which works out to 2.1K ohms. So you can see RT has gone from being the 2.2K ohm resistor to 2.1K ohm resistor due to the internal resistance of the inductor, R coil. So the Q of the circuit is going to be equal to RT divided by the XL parallel component. So that ends up being 2.1K divided by 1K. So we're looking for a Q of about 2.1. The bandwidth is equal to the resonant frequency divided by Q. So that's equal to 15.9K divided by 2.1. So we're looking for a bandwidth of about 7.6 K Hertz. The lower frequency or half power point is equal to the resonant frequency minus the bandwidth divided by two. So that ends up being 15.9 K minus 7.6 K divided by two. So the lower frequency should be 12.1 kilohertz. F2, the upper corner frequency, is equal to 15.9K, the resonant frequency, plus 7.6K divided by 2. So that works out to 19.7K. So going between 12K and about 20k should be a 7.6k range. So in table 11.1 I've filled in my resonant frequency, my Q, and F1 and F2. So it says under procedure number three we're to adjust the frequency in small amounts up and down until the maximum voltage is found. This is the experimental resonant frequency. And because XC and XL cancel each other out, we'll also have zero degrees phase shift. And we're to record this in table 11.1. .1. Continuing on in step number three, we're to note the amplitude. So, looking at my circuit, you can see that the uh, red terminal that comes from the function generator and channel 1 of the oscilloscope goes to the input of my 100k ohm resistor RS. The other leg of RS goes to my 2.2k ohm resistor that goes back to the common of the function generator. In parallel with the 2.2K uh, ohm resistor, I have my 10 nanofarad capacitor and my 10 millihenry inductor. And because they have shorter legs, I have a little jumper wire going back to the common of the function generator. Now channel 2 is my times 10 probe. And I've just hooked it up here to the other side of my 100k ohm resistor. So this is V parallel or V out. 
So I've just turned on my oscilloscope, so I'm going to go into default setup and do a factory default and say OK. And now I'm going to set up channel 1. My coupling needs to be on AC, bandwidth limit on, and my probe needs to be at a ratio of 1 to 1. Remember this is my input signal. On channel 2, my coupling needs to be on AC. I'm going to put my bandwidth limit on and the probe. We're using a 10 to 1 probe so you have to set up the ratio correctly or else all the numbers on the screen will be displayed incorrectly. So the next thing I like to do is put on my measurements and I've got frequency for channel 1 and peak to peak for channel 1 so I need to set up channel 2 for type peak to peak so I'll add that measurement in and now the next thing I'm going to do is put on my wave generator uh, right now we have a frequency of 1 kilohertz but my amplitude needs to be 10 volts peak to peak so I'm going to adjust that and then adjust my horizontal uh, scale so that I get a couple of cycles and then my vertical scale so that the waveform is not going off the screen and we'll take a look at channel 2 So under procedure, step number three, we're going to adjust the frequency in small amounts, up and down, until the maximum voltage is found. Now this can be calculated using the voltage divider rule, and it should come out to about 215 millivolts or less. Okay, this is going to be the experimental resonant frequency, and we want to record it in table 11.1, .1, and we're to note the amplitude. So the next thing I need to do is find out where my resonant frequency is. So starting at 1 kilohertz, I'm going to increase the frequency. And you'll notice as I increase the frequency, the voltage drop across channel 2 increases. So you're going to have to adjust the vertical sensitivity for channel 2. And also your horizontal scale. And then we can continue to increase the frequency and readjust the scales as we move along. Now we know resonant frequency is somewhere around 16 kilohertz, so you can start to slow down when you get close. So at 15 kilohertz, we're getting close. 16 kilohertz, close. 17 kilohertz looks like we're about there 18 kilohertz we've gone too far so i'm going to back it up to 17 kilohertz readjust my horizontal and we can see the waveforms are approximately in phase with each other now you can press in the entry knob and fine tune your frequency so you can get it in as close as possible to being 100 percent in phase now I'm close enough to 17 kilohertz that I'm going to record this as 17 kilohertz. I also need to know what the voltage drop across channel 2 is. And you can so you can see my voltage drop across channel 2 is bouncing around between 209 and 211 millivolts. So I'm going to record that as 210 millivolts dropped across channel 2. So in table 11.1 .1, I've recorded my resonant frequency as 17 kilohertz. And on table 11.2, I've recorded my resonant frequency as 17 kilohertz, and V parallel is 210 millivolts. So continuing on in procedure, step number three, we're to sweep the frequency above and below the resonant frequency until the experimental F1 and F2 corner frequencies are found. And this will occur at a voltage amplitude of approximately 0.707 times the resonant 
voltage. These are the half power points. So these should occur somewhere around 152 millivolts. We're to record these frequencies in table 11.1 .1, and then we're to determine and record the experimental Q based on the experimental resonant frequency F1 and F2. Now since my V parallel is 210 millivolts, I'm going to take 0 0.707 times the 210 millivolts and in my case it works out to 148.5 millivolts. So when my channel 2 voltage reaches 148.5 millivolts, I know I've reached F1 and F2. So to find F1, I need to decrease my frequency until the voltage drop across channel 2 is approximately 148 millivolts. So you can see when I get down to about 12 kilohertz, I'm at 139. So I'm going to put my frequency on fine. So you can see when I get to 12.4 kilohertz, the voltage drop across channel 2 is between 147 and 149. So I'm going to call that 148 millivolts and record F1 as 12.4 kilohertz. Now to find F2, I need to increase my frequency until the voltage drop across channel 2 is once again around 148 millivolts. So at 23, I've gone too far, so I'm going to put the fine on and back the frequency up. So for F2, I'm going to record the frequency as 22.2 kilohertz and the voltage drop across channel 2 is approximately 148 millivolts. I want you to notice the phase angle at F2 is approximately 45 degrees. So on table 11.2 I've recorded F1 as 12.4 kilohertz at 148 millivolts and F2 is 22.2 kilohertz at 148 millivolts. So back on table 11.1 .1, I've recorded F1 as 12.4 kilohertz, F2 as 22.2 kilohertz, and then I've calculated Q as being equal to the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth, and remember the bandwidth is F2 minus F1, so that becomes 17 kilohertz divided by 9.8 kilohertz, which works out to 1.74. So under procedure, step number four, they're telling us to take the experimental frequencies of table 11.1 .1 and put these in the top entries of table 11.2. Now we've already done that because we wanted to record those voltages. Now they're telling us to do this for all the frequencies in table 11.2 to measure and record the voltage across the parallel branch. So for the rest of table 11.2, they want to know what V parallel is at 1 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz, 12, 20, 30, 50, and 100 kilohertz. So filling in the rest of the chart at uh, 1 kilohertz, it looks like I'm getting about 8 millivolts across channel 2. At 5 kilohertz, I'm getting approximately 36 millivolts dropped across channel 2. At 8 kilohertz, I'm getting 64 millivolts dropped across channel 2. At 12 kilohertz, I'm getting 125, 127. I'm going to record that as 126 millivolts. At 20 kilohertz, I'm between 163, 165, so 164 millivolts. At 30 kilohertz, I'm at 88 millivolts. At 50 kilohertz, I'm at 42 millivolts. And lastly, at 100 kilohertz, I'm reading 22 millivolts across channel 2. 
So on table 11.2, I've recorded V parallel for each of the requested frequencies. So under procedure, step number five, it says based on the data from table 11.2, we're to plot the parallel branch voltage as a function of frequency on plot 11.1. .1. We're to label the resultant plot as low Q. So for plot 11.1, .1, where we're going to graph V parallel versus frequency, I've provided you with semi-log graph paper. So this is my plot 11.1. .1. You can see on the horizontal axes, I've already pre-labeled it for you, and it's frequency in kilohertz. Now this is called semi-log graph paper. So on the horizontal axes, we're actually using a logarithmic scale. So it goes from 1 kilohertz all the way up to 10 kilohertz. And as you get closer to 10 kilohertz, you can see the spacing gets smaller. And then it increases by 10. So it next step is 20 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, all the way up to 100 kilohertz. My vertical axis is voltage and it's in millivolts peak to peak and you can see I've already labeled it for you so the major division is 100 millivolts, 200 millivolts all the way up to a thousand millivolts or one volt. I've tried to put my points in as close as possible to my measured values and then I've tried to sketch in the line by hand and I've labeled my resultant as low Q. We're now moving on to the high Q circuit. So under procedure step number six it says for the high Q circuit change RA to 10k ohms. Remember RA was 2.2k ohms. Now we're to repeat steps one through five and we're to record our results on tables 11.3 and 11.4. Now we have a note here that the maximum voltage should be about 909 millivolts. That's taking the uh, voltage divider rule and taking the 10k over 110k times our input voltage of 10 volts uh, peak to peak. So 0.707 of the 909 millivolts will give us F1 and F2, and that should be somewhere around 642 millivolts or less. So the calculations for the high Q circuit, where RA equals 10K ohms, the first thing we're going to find out is what the total resistance is, and that's equal to RA in parallel with R coil parallel equivalent. And that's 10k times 45.5k divided by 10k plus 45.5k. And that works out to 8.2k ohms. So you can see if we just considered RA, it was 10k. But when we start considering that 22 ohms of the coil and take its parallel equivalent, it knocks our resistance down from 10k to 8.2k which will affect the Q of the circuit. So the Q of the circuit is calculated as RT over XL, parallel equivalent, which is 8.2K divided by 1K, and that works out to a Q of 8.2. So our bandwidth is equal to our frequency at resonance divided by Q, which is 15.9k divided by 8.2. So we're looking for a bandwidth of 1.94k. So we can see changing RA from 2.2 to 10.k changes our bandwidth from 7.6k to 1.94k. Our first corner frequency for F1 is Frequency at resonance minus the bandwidth divided by 2. 
So that's equal to 15.9k minus 1.9k divided by 2, and that's equal to 14.95k. Our upper corner frequency, or F2, is equal to the resonant frequency plus the bandwidth divided by 2, which is 15.9k plus 1.9k divided by 2, which works out to 16.89k. So in table 11.3, I've filled in my frequency at resonance. It's the same as before. It's still 15.915k hertz. Remember, it was the resistor that changed. The inductor and capacitor stayed the same. My Q is now 8.2. My first corner frequency, or F1, should be 14.95 kHz. And my upper frequency, F2, should be 16.89 kHz. So this is now my circuit, and I've swapped out RA that was 2.2 K ohms. It's now brown, black, orange, so that's a 10 K ohm resistor. Remember, you're switching out RA and not RS. RS still has to be the 100k ohm resistor. So having replaced my resistor with the uh, 10k ohm resistor, I now need to go back and uh, readjust my frequency to find the resonant frequency. And remember that's going to be when both waveforms are in phase. So my Output waveform is in phase with my input waveform. And that looks like it's happening around 16.6 kilohertz. And the voltage drop across channel 2 is just a little over 647, so I'm just going to call it 648 millivolts. So on table 11.3, I've recorded my resonant frequency as 16.6 kilohertz. And in table 11.4, I've also recorded V parallel as 648 millivolts. And it doesn't hurt for you to put in comments on your lab pages so that when you come back a month or two from now, you know that V parallel was actually volts in peak to peak. Now to find F1 and F2, that's going to be 0 0.707 of my resonant frequency maximum voltage. So it's 0 0.707 times 648 millivolts, which is equal to 458 millivolts. Now please note that in the procedure, we said the maximum was going to be 909 millivolts or less. In our case... And our maximum V parallel was 648 millivolts, which is less than the 909 millivolts maximum that was possible. So to find F1 and F2, we have to take 0 0.707 of our measured max for our circuit, which was 648. So F1 and F2 should be somewhere around 458 millivolts. So to find F1, I need to reduce my frequency until the channel 2 is measuring approximately 458 millivolts. So you can see here as I get close to about 15 kilohertz, the voltage uh, on channel 2 is now 456 millivolts. So that's going to be F1. Now to find F2, I need to increase my frequency until the voltage drop measured on channel 2 is approximately 458 millivolts. So you can see that around 18.2 kilohertz, the voltage drop is somewhere around 456 millivolts. So that would be my F2. So in table 11.3, I've recorded my resonant frequency is 16.6 kilohertz. 
F1, which is the lower frequency, is 15 kilohertz. F2 is the upper frequency is 8.2 kilohertz. Then calculating Q as being equal to the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth. And that's equal to 16.6 kilohertz divided by 18.2 kilohertz minus 15 kilohertz. And that works out to 5.2. Not quite as high as I thought it would be. So in order to fill out the rest of the chart, I've put the frequency back on coarse adjustment rather than the fine adjustment. Makes it uh, a lot easier. You don't have to rotate the knob so much. So at 1 kilohertz, you can see I'm getting approximately 8 millivolts dropped across channel 2. So at 5 kilohertz, you can see I'm getting approximately 37.6 millivolts dropped across channel 2. 8 kilohertz, I'm getting 72 millivolts on channel 2. So at 12 kilohertz, I'm getting approximately 184 millivolts dropped across channel 2. At 20 kilohertz, I'm getting approximately 284 millivolts. At 30 kilohertz, it looks like I'm getting about 112 millivolts. At 50 kilohertz, I'm getting 68 millivolts. And finally, at 100 kilohertz, I'm getting 44 millivolts on channel 2. So these are my results on table 11.4. So moving on to procedure step number 7, it says based on the data from table 11.4, plot the parallel branch voltage as a function of frequency on plot 11.1 and label the resultant plot as high Q. So in plot 11.1, I've tried to put my points in as close as possible to my measured values, and I've sketched my line in, and I've labeled it as high Q. On the last page of the lab, I have four questions for you to answer based on your calculations and observations of the lab. So when you come down to question number four, how would you account for the V parallel at FR in table 11.4 being much smaller than the maximum described under procedure six? You may have noticed that under procedure step number six, where RA was 10k ohms, we said the maximum voltage should be about 909 millivolts. And you'll notice our actual maximum at resonance was 648 millivolts. So I want to explain where the difference came from. So to find the maximum V parallel voltage, all I did was say that XL and XC are going to be equal, so they cancel each other out. So you should be left with a voltage divider situation where we have the 10K over 110k times the 10 volts applied and that should be equal to somewhere around 900 millivolts. We have to remember that there's a DC resistance to the coil and when we did the calculation to find out what the parallel conversion of that DC resistance was it was 45.5k ohms. So to come up with a more accurate voltage divider calculation, we have to take the 10K in parallel with the 45.5K, and that brings our RA value down to about 8.2K. So V parallel is equal to 8.2K over 108.2K times the 10 volts. And that works out to 758 millivolts which is a lot closer to our actual reading of 648 millivolts. You'll note under procedure step 3, we expected the maximum voltage to be about 215 millivolts or less. So when we took the 2.2K and divided it by the 102.2K times the applied 10 volts peak to peak, it came out to 215 millivolts 
when we compare the 2.2k to the 45.5k we can see that the 45.5k is so much larger than the 2.2k that it didn't make a major difference when we did our pre-lab calculation. So to sum up your answer for question number four, you could say something like, under procedure six, where we thought the maximum voltage should be about 909 millivolts, it did not account for the DC resistance of the inductor coil which needs to be converted to a parallel equivalent and then has to be added in parallel with the 10k ohm resistor to come up with the total DC resistance of the in circuit. When you've completed your lab, show it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete.